Welcome to another broadcast of Truth Be Told, where we believe an experience becomes truth. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and joining me now in studio, your other host, Captain Ron. Well, we have a great show for you. We have Peter Mansu with us today, and we're going to be talking about objects of devotion, religion in early America. Yes, this is going to be an exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, which, ex- which explores the wide range of religious traditions from 1600s clear up to mid-1800s. Peter is a Lilly Endowment Curator of American Religious History at the Smithsonian National Institute of American History. He was a winner of the National Jewish Book Award and the National Endowment for the Art Literature Fellowship. Among other awards, he is an author of One Nation Under Gods, A New American History, Rag and Bones, A Journey Among the World's Holy Dead, and Vows the Stories of a Priest, a Nun, and Their Son. So we want to welcome to Truth Be Told, Peter Mansu. Welcome, welcome, Peter. We appreciate you being here. How are you, sir? He's not here. I know. <laughs> Peter? I'm here now. Oh, there, there we is. go. There we go. <laughs> well, we are excited to have you here. Uh, one thing that we like to do is promote uh, historical events. And uh, this is one of the events that we'd like to talk about today is, uh, at the Smithsonian uh, that you have an exhibit that's going to be displayed and especially, you know, it's coming up is uh, 4th of July, and I think this is very important that uh, we talk about the early religion of America. So tell us about the exhibit. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a thrill to talk to you. Uh, the exhibit is called Religion in Early America. Uh, it covers roughly the years uh, 1630 to 1830, so the colonial period into the New Republic. Uh, and it really tries to tell the story of three factors in early American religious life, uh, religious diversity, religious freedom, and religious growth. So people who come to the exhibit will be surprised just to see just how diverse religion in early America was. Not only was there a huge number of uh, different Protestant Christian denominations vying for different for members of their churches, uh, but there was also a, a growing Catholic population, uh, a growing Jewish population, mm-hmm. It's often forgotten that many of the enslaved peoples were, had some connection to Islam when they arrived, and not to mention the Native American traditions, which were here uh, long before any European or African traditions arrived. So we try to tell the story of how these various communities interacted in early America. And we explain that the practical implication of all this diversity uh, eventually is religious freedom. In order for all these competing and conflicting ways of believing and being in the world to live together in one society, you could not have any one official church. At the time, many feared that not having an official state church would lead to the decline of religion as a moral force, Mm -hmm. and yet exactly the opposite happens. It creates greater competition between religious groups, which leads to uh, explosions of new forms of religion and new denominations, and that really sets this up for having the type of country we have now, where religion remains so vitally important uh, across the country. Oh, I, 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 I'm from the Midwest, so I, mean, I grew up in the Bible Belt, and I went on my you know, religious journey of uh, trying out different religions, uh, not just you know, Protestant. And, you know, <coughs> I, didn't do, I really didn't, I went, didn't grow up around Catholic, but uh, you know, I went to the Buddhist temple in Wichita and different places because I was curious, and I think uh, uh, everybody should go through that stage. Mostly snake handling, I thought. Was most, right. yeah, most. Mostly. But that, you know, that was just a family tradition, right. but a drunken night. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, what, one thing that I love is history of America, and some of the stuff that you have at, ex- at, the, at the exhibit itself are some amazing things. Could you tell us some of the stuff that's going to be on display? Sure. So we have objects both from the Smithsonian's collections, and the Smithsonian has millions of objects that we can draw upon. So we have some of those, but we also reached out to a number of different religious communities around the country and borrowed objects to tell those stories that we didn't necessarily have ready here at the museum. So from the Smithsonian's own collections, we have uh, probably the most significant document is a a Bible that uh, belonged to Thomas Jefferson. It's properly known, in fact, as the Jefferson Bible because he made this book his own. Uh, While he was at Monticello in his retirement, he was spending a lot of time reading the New Testament and wondering how he could reconcile uh, his idea of of Christian history with the ideals of the Enlightenment, the ideals that said you should live according to reason and rationality. So Jefferson went through his copies of the New Testament 
with a pen knife in hand, hmm. and he began to cut out those parts that he agreed with and leave behind the parts that he didn't, that he didn't think were useful awesome. to him. <laughs> so he took these pieces that he removed from the copies of the New Testament, and he glued them together into a new book that he called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, he knew this would be controversial during his lifetime, so he didn't tell anyone but a few friends. He, he had mentioned it in a handful of letters, uh, but it was just a secret for his own personal use. But eventually, uh, the Smithsonian discovered this, that this book existed, it discovered it uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, at the time, the Smithsonian published it and actually made it available to every new member of Congress for 50 years. Uh, it's hard to imagine that, that happening today, but that was what the Smithsonian did at the time. So that's just one example of the type of really surprising religion object we have, uh, to show that even in, in early America, uh, it was a very experimental approach to religion uh, among many Americans, mm -hmm. including, not least of all, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Can I can I ask you this? Uh, because growing up in the Midwest, and every you know majority that it's Christian, and Christian and white, but could you can you explain? Maybe you've done your research about the religious uh, thought of some of the founders of. United States. Uh, they weren't all just Christian. I know, doesn't Tom, uh, not Tom, uh, Benjamin Franklin, didn't they, didn't he, did he even believe in Christianity? Was I, mean, I can't, I can't remember because my, my thought doesn't go back that far. I would think yeah. they all were. But that's like well, me I not mean, knowing I'm, anything. Uh, well, I, th I think Benjamin Franklin thought differently, though. I don't know, maybe not. Well, Benjamin Franklin, um, like a lot of the founding generation, they, they went through periods of different religious I religious ideas during their lifetime, just as, as many people would today. Mm -hmm. And so Franklin saw himself as a Christian, but he also dabbled in this di idea that was popular at the time of deism. Deism, uh, deism is the idea that you can worship the god of nature. Uh, so it's basically Christianity, but without the idea that Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus, for, for many deists, is, is a moral exemplar. He's a, he's a teacher, as he was for Jefferson. Mm -hmm. When Jefferson was creating his Bible, uh, he said that he is a Christian in the only way that it would have mattered to Jesus, that you were someone who tried to follow according to the teachings of Jesus. So many of the founding generation, they, um, they would have called themselves Christians, but they also were experimenting at different points in their lives with, this, at the, with what at the time was a very um, unorthodox and considered radical uh, theology. And uh, I, I, I think it would be pretty controversial today if we had a lot of our uh, leaders in the in the political arena that would even say that you know oh, I'm I'm questioning you know any type of our you know Christianity no way I just don't see that happening today so uh, through through the 200 years 1630 to 1830 what was what was the transition was there a transition between those 200 years was there a big change in the thought of our leaders or in the political leaders and just society as a whole well no even at that early time there there would have been the expectation that that any leader who wanted to have sufficient support among a largely Christian nation would need to declare himself to be a Christian with, with, no, with no question about it. In fact, during the election of 1800, when John Adams was running against Thomas Jefferson, uh, the supporters of Adams uh, had a slogan, which was, uh, vote for Adams and a religious president, or you'll get Jefferson and no God. Uh. Uh, so so they, Jefferson was, um, people were very sus sus suspicious of the way Jefferson thought about religion, um, including his his uh, treatment of Scripture and his, in his thinking that you could be experimental with it. Uh, so there was no real agreement among the founding generation of how to, how to work with religion, how, what place it should have in, in society. What we think of now as religious freedom was, it was not inevitable and it was not immediate. It was a product of negotiation over the course of, of many years as this new nation was trying to figure out what role religion should have in, in society. Now we've talked about uh, you know Thomas Jefferson. What was the, the the religious thought of George Washington? George Washington is an interesting religious figure, um, and in, in the exhibit we include a couple um, Bibles related to to Washington, as well as some other uh, objects from from his religious life. We have in in, in the Smithsonian collections we have uh, Washington's christening blanket in 1732 when he was baptized as an infant into the Anglican Church. He was wrapped in this silk blanket, which we still have here at the mm -hmm. Smithsonian, 
uh, and early in the 20th century, people would make pilgrimages to, to come and see it more out of uh, the cult of veneration of Washington himself than f- for any desire to to uh, to link his his baptism to the notions of, of a Christian nation. Uh, but we also have these two Bibles related to the Washington family. Uh, we have the George Washington inaugural Bible, so the Bible on which he took the first oath of office, mm-hmm. and a Bible that he gave to Martha Washington soon after he became president. So there was both a, a public role of religion in the life of Washington and a private role. Uh, and the, this this book, the, a Bible, two different Bibles, they played these different roles. So as the first head of state, he did take his oath of office on a Bible. Um, it was made available to him by the, the local Masonic Lodge in, the, in New York City, which continues to own it. Mm. Uh, but for his wife, um, he, he gave a Bible that she read daily, and passages from Scripture were a solace to them. They shared them in their letters. So there was a recognition that religion had a public role, but also that it had a private role, and they weren't always the same. It's interesting you say he got the Bible from the local Masonic Lodge. Now, how does that tie into, I would think, Freemasonry would kind of conflict with religion. Because usually in some they way. don't choose a religion. Yeah. How's that work? Well, Washington was a Mason, uh, right. and he uh, during his inauguration, uh, the the marshal of the inaugural parade was a member of the Masonic Lodge close to Federal Hall in New York City. And only at the very last minute did someone say, "We're having this inauguration. Really, we should have a Bible on which to take this oath." It, it had not been planned out before. So the marshal of the inaugural parade said, actually, we have a wonderful Bible over at the lodge. Let me go get it, and I'll bring it back. And, and that's the one they used. Uh, but Washington was a Mason, uh, at, and he was also uh, a member of the Anglican Church throughout his life. But he did express some uh, discomfort with certain religious rituals. Uh, he was thought not to want to receive communion in church, for example. Uh, some some letters ha- have recorded him sneaking out the back when it's time to receive communion at church. <laughs> so th- he had his own particular ideas about religion, uh, and he was not as eloquent about it um, as, as Jefferson was in, in many of Jefferson's writings. But he's also made some really powerful statements in support of religious freedom, most particularly in his correspondence with... Uh, various Jewish communities uh, early in his presidency. Uh, during the, the, so his first uh, administration, many Jewish communities around the country wrote to him and said, in this new nation, will we also have freedom of religion? And he wrote back to them very eloquently and explained that uh, freedom of religion in this new nation is not going to be merely about tolerance. Uh, we, we use the word tolerance now, and we think it's, it's only a good thing. Uh, but when, Jeff, when Washington said tolerance, he meant that um, tolerance assumes that one community or one set of beliefs has the authority, and they only allow the minority beliefs to exist um, just because they allow them to do so. Uh, But he was saying that religious freedom in America would be more than tolerance. It's that the majority and the minority beliefs have just as much right to practice in public. Hmm. You know, I was going to ask you, Peter, what a great thing that the Smithsonian is. Think about we have the original Bible that our first president was sworn in on. I think that's incredible. That's incredible, yeah. It's astonishing. It's um, it's like when you got there, uh, were you amazed by the artifacts you were able to have access to? Oh, I am. It's uh, we we commonly call this museum the nation's attic. You never know what you're going to find <laughs> hidden away, and uh, it's true. It's um. It's there are real there are millions of treasures here. Well, you know, I don't want to jump to this till the end, but uh, this is truth be told. You know, in our subculture of people that talk about these kind of things, it's notorious that you guys have stuff buried somewhere that you won't <laughs> show the public. Have you ever seen or heard of anything that's sort of uh, not shown or? Well, you know, I I got into the religion business really because I wanted to be Indiana Jones, <laughs> and I and I was really taken uh, when I was small and I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark and I saw that warehouse where they had all the hist- all the mysteries passed Perfect away. Example. I thought yep. that must be the Smithsonian, <laughs> right? And so I have seen warehouses like that, and I um, and uh, I, I cannot divulge what we have hidden there. So oh, there you go. You on that just they say tease. they have giants. They say they've got That's teeth. They say they've got all teases. kinds of stuff. Don't tease us like that. <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, one thing that I know is this is, you know, even and I don't want to get political, but you know, a little bit. But, you know, they keep saying that, you know, this is a Christian nation. This is a Christian nation. But uh, is this true that John Adams said the United States is not a Christian nation any more than it's a Jewish or well, uh, can't even how to pronounce it. But I think it's like Mohammedan or Mohammed. What is it? Mohammedan. Yeah. There we go. So. Yeah. So 
so tell us, tell, talk to our audience and our, ourselves about when we say this is a Christian nation. Do we do we still feel that way now? I mean, because it sounds like some of our founding fathers didn't feel completely that way. No, and, and really, uh, this question of whether or not we are a Christian nation uh, has a, has a few different answers. Uh, and if you're talking about the the early part of America, as well as today, if you're talking about a demographic majority, mm-hmm. uh, then mm-hmm. yes, there is a demographic majority of, of Christians. Um, however, if you want to make it a question about the founding principles, um, then it's it's not true in the same way, because then it becomes a matter, uh, it becomes almost a question of who is American. Mm-hmm. And the fact is that from the very beginning, non-Christians were Americans. Um, Non-Christians did not always have the same rights uh, for various reasons, um, but they were, they were Americans. Uh, and looking back, even those who were not considered citizens, we look back and think of them as, as their experience as part of the American experience. If you think of the experience of the enslaved, for example. When, um, when um, Africans were brought here by force, they had their own beliefs and practices. Um, African traditional beliefs, there are probably a dozen different religions, as well as Islam. Islam was a significant part of the uh, religious experience of the enslaved. This was not really on the radar of the founding fathers who were talking about freedom of religion. So even at that point, religious diversity was bigger than the discussion of what kind of nation we we were founding. Uh, They were here from the beginning. Religious diversity has only increased since then. Uh, And so uh, really, I think that we... um, the question is really who gets to include themselves uh, among the American people. And the answer to that, as far as religious groups are concerned, is everyone. Right, right. And, and I, I'm glad that in this exhibit that you guys are, uh, have included the Native Americans, who really, if you think about the, the religion that was here before us, is the Native Americans. So uh, how, how did you intertwine that with the exhibit? Uh, in a few different ways. We wanted to show that from the very earliest introduction of Europeans into the Americas, it, it wasn't only a story of, of Christianity uh, displacing Native beliefs. There was a long period of negotiation and, and interactions between beliefs. Uh, and so one of the objects we have is the first Bible printed in uh, English North America. Hmm. And interestingly, this Bible, a um, copy of the Old and the New Testament, is a translation into the Algonquin Indian language. And so into the languages cool. of the of the um, tribes of southern New England, uh, printed in 1663, and certainly this was a Bible printed uh, for the purpose of converting Native Americans to Christianity. But in the process of creating this, uh, this Puritan minister John Eliot, he also learned a great deal about Native American religious practices uh, because he needed to learn the Algonquin language, uh, and similarly. Uh, a figure like Roger Williams. Uh, Roger Williams is the founder of the colony of Providence, which becomes uh, eventually becomes the, the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and he is evicted from Massachusetts for his own heretical religious ideas. And as he's traveling through southern New England looking for a place to start a colony of his own, he spends a great deal of time with the Narragansett Indians and likewise learns that they have their own beliefs and practices. And it, it's not going to simply be a matter of bringing a religion in, into a, a blank slate of, of, of a country. So there, is this, um, there are many generations of interactions between uh, Christian beliefs and Native American beliefs, and um, the objects we include in the exhibit try to show those interactions. Mm, that's great. That's great. I, uh, my, my seventh great grandfather was uh, Richard Stockton, which, who is one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And mm-hmm. so, uh, <coughs> wow. yeah, and that's why I'm so interested in that era of, of, you know, of our country, because, you know, it's part of my family history. So, uh, but what I find fa- fascinating that, you know, most people came to America and at least wanted to start American because of re- religious freedom. Um, that's, and, and I feel that um, even America or Americans, the white people forced Christianity on the It seems like American. Christianity crushed everything else. Yeah. Like he mentioned that, Peter, you were saying that all these uh, Africans had different African like, beliefs. Like Islamic and, Those are yeah. all buried. 
Yeah. Other than yes. Islam, right. I, I never hear about any of those. Right. Yeah. And the really interesting thing is that in the middle of the 19th century, this was common knowledge. It, it would not have been surprising <laughs> to anyone to hear about a Muslim slave, for example, uh, in the 1830s. Yeah, you don't hear uh, that but at by all. the end of the end of the 19th century, it's completely forgotten. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I've only learned about it within the past five years through hmm. through research, and it's not something that is ever uh, is ever taught. Uh, even when you talk about the history of slavery in this country. Uh, what happened religiously to these people who were enslaved is, is rarely mentioned. Now, did, did uh, the African Americans or the, the slaves, did they actually have to practice their religion, Islam, Islamic religion, uh, secret, secretly uh, when they were enslaved? Well, for the most part, uh, as soon as they arrived, they were, they were removed from communities of, of, of faith. So they did not have oh. people with whom they could share beliefs. They did not have... Um, the material culture that's required for passing on uh, okay. a tradition like Islam. Uh, but we do know of one community uh, at a remote plantation on, on a small island right on the coast of Georgia. So it's called Sapelo Island. And there was a community there, uh, in part because it was a very remote place, where a, um, an enslaved man was, had enough authority on this plantation uh, as um, as a leader of other slaves, that he became a kind of religious leader of this small Muslim community. And we know this because we, we have in the exhibit uh, the only known Islamic religious text written by an enslaved Muslim uh, in America. It was written early in the 19th century. It's written in Arabic, in Georgia, wow. and it's just a, a handbook of how to practice Islam <laughs> it, uh, when you are removed from your community. It explains the, the times at which they pray, this is why we wash our hands and our feet before we pray. So the very basics uh, of religious practice, uh, but it's written as a way of passing on to the next generation something that uh, would have been um, known to everyone uh, back home in West Africa before they were brought here. So why do, so why do you think that uh, it's kind of being erased? And like you said, you didn't hear it. I didn't know it. Why is this being erased from our history? Because this is our history. Well, a lot of it has to do, uh, especially having to, the question of uh, religious identity of the uh, of the enslaved population. Mm-hmm. A lot of it has to do with the later history of of Christianity becoming such a significant part of the African American experience, mm-hmm. and some of that can be traced really to the years right after the Civil War. So, right after emancipation, um, uh, the um, there are a number of um, of missionaries who come down from free African-American churches in the North to convert the, the newly released uh, slaves. Uh, and they, they embrace Christianity. Uh, they collectively create the phenomenon that's, that's often referred to as the black church, you know, a number of different denominations together as uh, this thing called the black church. And Christianity becomes such a vital part of the, American, of the African-American experience that all the other traditions are kind of follow, fall out of the collective memory. That's great. And I, I, I'm going to... Oh, when is the exhibit? So when did, did it already start? How long does it go for? The exhibit opens uh, next Wednesday, June 28th, and it, and it runs for one year. Oh, one year. Uh, and ah. I, sh- I should add, for those who are not able to get to Washington, we do have a, a book version of the exhibit. It's called Objects of Devotion and Religion in Early America. It's published by Smithsonian Books, and it can be... Uh, purchased ar- around the country. And Peter, isn't it true that that this is you? You took this position over at, in the S- Smithsonian. They haven't had that in over a hundred years. That's right. Uh, this the American History Museum, in fact, has never had a curator of American uh, of religion. Wow. Uh, early in the history of the Smithsonian, when the Smithsonian was just one museum, it, the Smithsonian is now eighteen museums. Wow. But when it was just one, called the U.S. National Museum, uh, at the end of the nineteenth century, they did have a division of religion then. And so it's, um, it's really a re-engagement with something the Smithsonian did very early in its history. It's great they brought and, that uh, back. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement, I think, that if you, if you avoid religion, it seems like you're uh, intentionally ignoring it. And <laughs> right. you simply can't tell the story of American history unless you really engage with religion. Right, and well, that's a big part of our history, and that's yeah. how we started. So, well, I want, I want to start uh, looking at your, your work that you've done. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your book, One Nation Under Gods? Sure. The One Nation Under Gods uh, is a 
a full retelling of American religious history uh, that tries to uh, leave Christianity out of it, if you can imagine that. It takes for granted that there has been a huge amount of Christian influence in American, in American history. And it, it, the book proceeds by basically asking, can we tell a history of America that is about minority religious traditions, that is about traditions uh, living alongside Christianity, uh, but always in its shadow? And it, it becomes a story of the ways in which uh, the majority tradition, the Christian tradition, and the minority traditions, a great many of them, have influenced each other throughout history. So it's not simply a story of the smaller traditions being dominated by the larger. It's the story of, of change through time of, of both um, the large traditions and the small. See, it's not about ancient aliens, Tony. Right. Yeah, see, we thought, it was, we thought Van Danigan was a co-author on that, but I guess not. That's hilarious. But I should say that it's a, it's a book that it tells a 500-year history, but I try to tell it through the stories of, of individuals. So it has 18 chapters, and each of the chapters finds a, a person or a community that shows this uh, interaction, a, a negotiation between the majority tradition and a minority tradition. Now, these 18 chapters, were, were most of this stuff that you had the knowledge of before you wrote the book, or did you write the book as you were learning the knowledge? And if you did, what were some of the, the, the most, I guess, thrilling and maybe even shocking things that you put into the book? Yeah, I, I wrote the book as I was researching it, and one way I researched it was really just going back and reading... Uh, 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 old newspapers. That was my beginning point. So I'd go back through digital newspaper archives, which now go back deep into the 17th century sometimes. And you can go back and just read the news as it was reported uh, to early Americans. So I would go, go, would go back and just look for stories that seem to indicate some uh, presence or influence of these minority religious traditions. And then I would try to, uh, to through research, to, to fill in the gaps of what was not reported in, in those uh, first-hand accounts. Uh, one, one thing that we've touched on before, and we've actually done a couple uh, episodes on, is the, the Witches of Salem. Uh, yeah. And I, I mean, this, this is a subject I think it will continue uh, to as long as America is here. I mean, people it's are notorious. interested. Yeah. yeah, it's notorious. And so a lot of people don't real, realize that some of it wasn't really religion. They blamed it on religion, but could you explain a little bit more for the people that don't know the background of the Salem's, or the, the witches of Salem? Sure. Uh, so the Salem witch trials unfold in uh, 1692 in, in, um, in a number of towns, actually, in Massachusetts. Salem gets most of the attention, but a number of towns all around, all around that region uh, had these accusations of witchcraft going on. Uh, but it's really kicked off by these events in Salem where a few uh, young girls uh, are stricken ill with some kind of mysterious malady. No one can really understand what's happening to them. Um, one local woman asks uh, a, uh, an enslaved woman, a, a woman who is uh, enslaved from, she's likely from Barbados, uh, and originally is, is probably a, uh, a native of South, of South America, in fact, and her name is Tichiba. Uh, so one of the local women of Salem asks Tichiba to perform a uh, small ritual uh, to cure these children of whatever is ailing them and to find out who is afflicting them in some kind of spiritual way. So Tichiba makes something that's called a, a um, witch cake, uh, which is, involves taking cornmeal, mixing, mixing it with the urine of a dog, mm. uh, baking it, feeding it to the dog, and then the dog is supposed to tell you who is uh, afflicting these children. Uh, and so this sets in, in motion a whole range of events uh, that involve accusations of demonic possession and uh, talking to devils and, and witchcraft. So, uh, and of course, at a certain point, it seems that people are accusing each other of witchcraft just because mm -hmm. they, they don't like how their neighbor yeah. uh, doesn't mend their fence, right. uh, or yeah. they don't like this woman <laughs> is a gossip in town. And so this seems to be a good way to cause some trouble for someone you don't like. So, don't so it's a mass hysteria <laughs> that takes over. Yeah. But the really interesting thing about this, at least as far as I, I tell the story in the book, is that uh, we look back at this, and it's the, it's the beginning of our use of the phrase a witch hunt. And a witch hunt means <laughs> now that you're hunting for something that isn't actually there. But when you look at the actual practices that we're being engaged with, there was actually something like witchcraft uh, going on. It, it's not that it was necessarily um, uh, what, what others thought witchcraft was. It was not having uh, conversations with demons, but rather it was 
uh, magical and religious practices that fell outside the Christian norm. Uh, so it was very challenging to this uh, Puritan society that strove to be a theocracy governed by a homogenous religious culture. It was very threatening to those established authorities. And so it, the true story, as I understand it, uh, of Salem, it is this story of, of hidden religious diversity, that this woman, Tichiba, who grew up in, in the Barbados, uh, in this complex of Native and African cultures and beliefs, brings some of those with her into New England, and the results are, are very dramatic. I can't even imagine being alive at that time. I know. It's just That's... so insane. Uh, Peter, uh, we're going to take a quick break, so hit our sponsors real quick, and we'll be right back. Uh, we'll be back talking more with Peter about religion in early America. And when we get back, wait till you hear whose parents, whose Peter's parents were. I know. Because <laughs> this locked me up when I read it the first time. So you, uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be back in just a minute here. I am Captain Ron with Tony Sweet on Truth Be Told. We'll be right back. You suffer from anxiety, from depression, maybe even chronic pain. Well, listen up. Truth Be Told is going to tell you about a breakthrough program built on over 100 years of therapies used in America's returning veterans to help you successfully overcome PTSD, anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. The secret proven in study after study. Music therapy. The effects of music are nothing short of amazing. From strokes to PTSD, music has been shown to improve the quality of life. Now one of the latest music therapy programs being used in America's veteran hospitals can be yours to experience for free at home and to help your own anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. Or just relax after a hard day. It's called Whole Tones. It takes music therapy to a new level. This revolutionary program makes use of specifically designed frequencies that have been shown to stimulate your body's natural healing power down to a cellular level. If it works for battle-scarred vets, can it work for you? Well, experience it for yourself for free at SweetWholeTones.com. Like Tony Sweet, that's S-W-E-E-T. Go to SweetWholeTones.com. Now enjoy the show. We are back on Truth Be Told. I'm Captain Ron with Tony Sweet, and we have Peter with us telling us about uh, religion in early America. But first, we're going to talk about Peter personally for just a moment, because the opening line of Peter's bio says that he is the son of a nun and a priest. So <laughs> It's not a joke. I, I don't know how that works. Yeah. Is this an immaculate conception kind of a thing? Is that how you got into religion? Peter, could you, could you just fill me in on that and tell our audience what's going on with that? Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, um, my father before I was born, was a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston, so in Massachusetts, and my mother was a uh, teaching sister, a sister of St. Joseph, also in, in Boston. So they met uh, in the late 1960s, both working in a um, section of Boston known as Roxbury, and uh, this is not too long after a period in the Roman Catholic Church known as Vatican II, which was this moment of trying to, mo trying to modernize the Church. And some priests like my father, believed that the Catholic Church would soon uh, roll back its rule of celibacy. So the Catholic Church doesn't allow its priests to marry or to have children, uh, because they uh, believe that the priest should be devoted to, its, to the Church and to his congregation uh, in such a way that he would not have time for a wife and family. So following Vatican II and so many modernizing things happening in the Church, uh, my father believed this rule would soon change, and he decided he would try to, to move the church on a little bit by just by just getting married and seeing what happened. <laughs> so, he um, uh, among the people he knew at the time uh, were a number of nuns and former nuns. So he he met my mother, and they met, fell in love, and got married. Uh, my mother at that point was had already left the convent. She was happy to no longer be a nun, though she had been one for ten years. Uh, but my father did not resign his ordination. So. Hmm. He is technically still a Catholic priest, but he's well. A did he hit system. backlash? What was the repercussions of this? Oh yeah, it was a huge backlash at the time. Um, there was uh, a headline in the paper that said you know, "Priest marries nun," and it was it was a big scandal. Oh my goodness! Uh, and um, at the time, within Catholic culture, it was thought that you should, if you were a priest who did this, you should move 500 miles away. Uh, so you would not scandalize anyone who knew you as a priest if they happened to see you walking down the road. Wow. Uh, and they actually did this for a time. They moved to Chicago for a time, but then they moved back to Boston, wow. uh, where both of their families were uh, settled there. <laughs> and then the controversy subsided, and they, and they tried to raise a good Catholic family. 
You're preordained for this position. It just seems perfect, doesn't it? It just worked out great for you. That's and, awesome. And you can well, get. Well, you know, it, it always made me fascinated just by the the way religious belief works in people's lives. Uh, not only in the Catholicism with with, with which I was raised, but all all traditions. Um, it, just the the hand of of the invisible on believers, and which isn't to say only. Uh, what some people would think of as as God, but also just uh, the culture and the community and what the community expects of you with any particular uh, uh, religious institution. Okay, so after studying this for all these years, which religion's wrong? <laughs> come on, no, come, come on. on, tell us here. To break breaking news, tell us. Well, you know, I, I really think that that kind of question is is, is close to which language is wrong. Um, right, uh, religions are really just different ways of expressing ideas, uh, and so they give you a vocabulary for talking about things, often from mysterious things. Often, uh, they they let you talk about interactions between between people within society. So uh, in the same way that we would not um, read a poem and say, this is, this is false, uh, you can't really look at a, an expression of religion and say, this is simply false. You need to know um, the culture from which it comes from. You need to know what is actually being expressed to understand the, re- the real meaning. And if you want to pick up that book, it's called A Family of Vows, The Son of a Priest it, and a Nun. Is that right? It's just called Vows. And oh, the just title Vows. Is the, the Story of a Priest, a Nun, and Their Son. Perfect. Yep. And where can they pick that up uh, on Amazon and all that good stuff? Sure, on Amazon or any on the online retailer. Sure. Well, I want I want to kind of jump back a little bit to uh, go back to the book One Nation Under Gods. Uh, during World War II, I knew you know when the Japanese attacked and we put everybody in in termite camps, camps the Japanese. Uh, I I didn't know. In in your book, it said that Buddhists were persecuted. Why? Yeah. Why? Because you don't think of a Never violent. Heard this. You know, violence in, in Buddhism at all. I mean, th- most of the Buddhist people I've ever met are some, some of the most chill, re- you know, down-to-earth people. So what, why did they persecute Buddhists? Well, it was specifically Japanese Buddhists. Oh. And so the assumption was that um, if you were still, if you were a Japanese immigrant and you still belonged to a Buddhist temple or a Shinto temple, they assumed that you had a greater connection to the homeland than if you had converted to Christianity, let's hey. say. Uh, and they assumed that Buddhist temples um, would be places where uh, you are more likely to use the Japanese language, uh, you'd be more likely to receive Japanese publications mm-hmm. uh, from overseas. And so they took for granted that you were a potential security risk uh, because of this international connection um, in a language that um, seemed to some to be a, a matter of, uh, of wanting to keep secrets. And so during the, the internment of Japanese Americans, among the very first people rounded up were Japanese Buddhist priests. Uh, and there are stories throughout California of the FBI showing up in the middle of the night at, at Buddhist temples, uh, knocking on the door and taking, and taking the priest away. Um, and this is before the formal internment, uh, the mass internment uh, of Japanese Americans on the West Coast took place. So they were really seen as, as the primary security risk. Um, they were thought to be potential spies. Tony, I love how this is all stuff that I've never heard. I don't think it's like in the just in the norm. People saying. don't know this about it. This is good it. stuff. Like, who who would have yeah. known this? It's amazing. Were it's you were you surprised thing by about it? this treatment? The fascinating thing about this treatment of Japanese Buddhists during World War II is that it maps very closely with the treatment of of Muslims uh, immediately after nine eleven. Let's say mm-hmm. um, there is an immediate suspicion of the leaders of a, of a religious group that that many come to right. assume has uh, international connections. Well, uh, because of time, I, I want to I touch on one more subject. And I've been fascinated. I've never joined one. I don't want to join one, but I find cults fascinating. And this is another uh, subject that you've included in your book. Uh, why did you include, uh, I guess, cults into your book? Because we don't, a lot of times, I guess we think of religious cults, but why did you include cults? Well, in the book, I try to tell a story in every generation. So when, mm-hmm. I, when I divided up this 500-year history, I came up with roughly uh, these 18 chapters. And when I got to uh, the 1950s and 60s, I really thought that the, the rise of, um, of what's commonly known as cults or small religious movements um, in America uh, was, was significant. It was significant in a way... Uh, beyond the numbers of those who, who actually join the cults. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in the ways that, that small groups can have a very outsized cultural influence. 
And so I, I, I too have never joined a cult (laughs) and I don't know people who have joined a cult. And yet uh, here we are talking about them because they have a huge cultural influence, even if we've never met people who have actually done so. So they're, they're lodged in our understanding about the potential risks uh, of religious conviction and religious devotion. And so that, that's why I wanted to tell that story. Well, why do you think cults, I guess, rose up so quickly? And I mean, I'm sure that maybe they were before that, but why, why so many in a short period of time in that time period? Why do you feel? Was it like a rebellion to, uh, of religion? or? Well, they rise up at, at volatile times, and it, it's... it's um, it's similar to many other moments in American history when there's this mass uh, reorganization of religious categories. Uh, so we look back at early American history, and these mo- there are these moments called the Great Awakenings. And when we look back at them now, we see them mainly as the moments when some of the mainstream denominations are, are, are being formed, like mm-hmm. Methodism. Methodism grows out of the 18th century when um, people are leaving in droves from uh, Anglican churches and Puritan congregational churches. And at the time, it seems like everyone is just abandoning church and going out to these big revivals out in the field, and it doesn't really seem like... It seems in, it, it's inconceivable that this will lead to a very, um, a very traditional denomination down the road. But what's really happening is people are, are leaving behind one kind of a re- religious affiliation and trying something which seems radical at the time. Mm-hmm. So given... Um, Given another hundred years, we might look back at the 1960s, say, and see that this experimentation with cults is very similar in the sense that it's, uh, of abandoning traditional forms, trying something new, mm-hmm. and what becomes of them, you can't really tell until you're a generation removed from it. And, I, you know, I think since I've moved to California, uh, I, I feel everybody around me, they don't ever say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual. I mean, I hear this all the time. And there's people here on our network that are psychics and, you know, and, and mediums and healers, and none of them really look at religion anymore. They always say spirituality. Can you, can you define that uh, in your studies of the d- difference between spirituality and a religion? Well, I... I, uh, you know, as a as a scholar of religion, I I, I don't think there is a difference. I, I think that um, if religion is a useful category, it needs to be it needs to be something that we can use to understand mm-hmm. um, many different types of experiences, not just the experiences of people who go to traditional churches, which is what those who say the word spiritual, who, who define themselves that way, that's what they think of as religious. They think of it as something that's organized religion. Mm -hmm. Um, But really, the vocabulary of being spiritual, the words one uses, um, it it comes from a very specific religious uh, genealogy. Um, They get their vocabulary from organized religion, even if they want to distance themselves from it. Mm -hmm. So we can't really, we can't really escape (laughs) religion um, as, as a category and as something that exists within history. It may change over time. It may find expressions such as people referring to themselves as spiritual but not religious, um, but it, it's, it's all part of the same spectrum. Yeah, but and organized it, and, uh, religion, that's a good way to say it, organized religion. That's how I think of it when I think of right, it. Yeah. Yeah, like that's sort of like yeah, you know, Somebody's, corruption and big... It's almost like another big company to me, right, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. I think some people yeah. run away from that like I do. Kind of. <laughs> and yeah, you, but you only, you only have to study... Um, cults and small groups for a very short time to see that they know that the big churches aren't the only ones who have that's, corruption. That's before. right. True. That's True. right. And do you feel, yeah. and I know we've got to get going here in a second, but do you feel the, the decline in people attending organized religions? I mean, we keep, we're not seeing it hardly ever increase. Probably the only increase was for a temporary time during 9-11, when a yeah. lot of people went back to churches. We no. keep seeing the more and more churches going out of business, which that they are. It's a business. And more and more people are leaving the church, the organized religion. Do you ever see the, an upswing again, or do you see the continuation of the decline in organized religion? Well, see, I, I just see this decline as, as a transformation, uh, and it's too soon to know what it will look like. Mm-hmm. It won't look like what it looked like 50 years ago, so mm-hmm. we won't see... Um, we won't see church attendance like it was, um, but we may see attendance in other types of communal activities grow. Right. People like to be part of communities, sure. uh, and the terms of those communities change over time. 
the names of the buildings where we meet change, but there's always a way, there's always something that bring, brings us together. Well, Peter, you're so fascinating. Absolutely. You really, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to have somebody that's uh, very uh, uh, well versed in this, this topic, and uh, I know our audience are going to really enjoy it. Uh, again, uh, people can pick your book up. Uh, go to uh, petermensu.com. Uh, uh, you can look at all his uh, books there. Go to Amazon, pretty much every bookstore, I'm sure, that uh, uh, ha- carries books. And then, again, tell us the, uh, the exhibit's going to be starting when and goes to when. It opens uh, June 28th here in, at the National Museum of American History in Washington, and it runs through the following June, June 2018. You see, Peter, uh, he doesn't pay attention to his own show. So he missed that it was going to run for a year, and he missed. Oh, I heard it, but I wanted. Oh, to you want to re re hear it? Yeah, okay, I just wanted him to say it, not me. I, you know, I don't want to take all his time up. Got it. But uh, we really appreciate you being here, and we hope you come back. And I'm hoping to get out there one day to, and to see the exhibit. I would love to. And That'd then, cool. in, then I think you said on there that you're going to take us to the back room where all the stuff is right, right? buried. Yeah. Yeah, Barry. Yeah. I think that's what you said. Yeah, we're off the air I'll, now, I'll, so uh, we'll plan on that. Yeah. I'll open up the warehouse. I'll there get, I'll get you go. That's it. That's we, we got want. it. We got it. We got it on tape. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Talk to you bye. soon. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Pretty cool, huh? I loved it. I, you know, sometimes you never know where a conversation is going to go, but this this guy's smart. Yeah, he knows his stuff. He no knows his stuff. It. And we hope you guys enjoyed it, and we want you to uh, uh, go see the exhibit if you can. And I agree. I, I, I'm i glad you asked that question. That uh, Well, the question of how come we should. Which one's wrong? <laughs> that well, one? No, of like, okay, you guys are hiding a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I and know. And he admits it. They are. I love it. He I'm admits it. They are. I can't divulge. That, that comes out of all the time. Like stuff yeah. goes missing. They say that's where it yeah. goes, supposedly. Yeah. The giants and everything. Hey, uh, next week, folks, we're going to be coming to you, believe it or not, from the 70th anniversary of Roswell. I'm, I, I can't wait. This is going to be, be great. great. We're going to interview some of the great speakers there. I know Linda Moulton Howe is going to be there. I, I can't remember all the others, but uh, we're going to interview as many as we can and get some uh, scoop. Maybe we can find some family members that, uh, you know. Hey, 70 years, you never know. You never know. All right. Well, go to our website, truthbetoldwebtv.com. Uh, check out some of the upcoming guests. We have some great guests coming up in July. Uh, and then uh, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, leave comments. We want to hear from you. And please, we there's been a lot of people suggesting people to have on our show. And uh, some of these Love people are, are from you, your suggestions. So, well, until next time, this is Truth Be Told. I'm Tony Sweet. Captain Ron. And we'll see you here on Truth Be Told. Or Roswell. Or Roswell. Bye.